Hi, this is Peter Beal, and I want to uh, just talk briefly about the idea of Renaissance humanism, a cultural movement that starts in earnest in the 14th century and continues through probably well into the 16th century. I think the argument could be made that the Protestant Reformation, among other things, um, and the rise of science and scientific revolution toward the end of the 16th century um, ultimately ensure the demise of Renaissance humanism as an important intellectual movement, although the effects are very much with us right to this day. Renaissance humanism is uh, primarily focused on an uh, intellectual movement that uh, shows up in the 14th century, primarily in Italy. And we can see that uh, developing in the work of a, a number of people whom we'll study just a little bit uh, in more depth in a, in a minute. It's important because it has a great deal of um, interesting effects on the culture of the time, uh, of course, the visual culture and literary culture, but also uh, in the political culture of the era. And this is, of course, of particular relevance in discussing the history of city-states such as Florence and um, the political ideas, the political messages, and indeed the personalities that arise in, uh, in this period. To begin with, we should probably think a little bit about what uh, humanism means its relationship to a concept such as Renaissance and move forward from there. I th would suggest there's a number of different, uh, in a sense, humanisms, and we should probably just walk quickly through uh, what's going on there. One of the most important ideas has to do with, uh, linked with humanism, has to do with education. And it's worth pointing out that in the Middle Ages, we have a fairly um, vocational approach, or at least professional approach to education, particularly higher education, which is itself a product of the Middle Ages, the foundation of the great universities uh, in Europe, such as in Paris or Bologna or, or, or Padua, um, primarily was intended to educate young men, pretty much exclusively men, in the fields of knowledge they would need to be uh, professionals in uh, at the time. Primarily, we'd have faculties of uh, theology, law, and medicine uh, operating in these um, in these universities. We start seeing, uh, by the time we come into the 14th century, and we might particularly turn to someone, and we'll see in just a little bit more depth shortly, Petrarch, for a reaction against this relatively narrow and, uh, again, vocational or at least pre-professional approach to education. A good way of thinking of this might be, for instance, to consider the role of Aristotle in the thought of the time, um, and particularly his emphasis on logic, or at least the emphasis in the Middle Ages on using logic. Um, a, a shift certainly occurs, I think, in the 14th and going into the 15th century, away perhaps from Aristotle and towards Plato, and in particular a shift away from um logic and maybe more towards rhetoric and the ability to uh, speak publicly, to speak eloquently, elegantly, to show that one's mastery of Latin was more than, um, again, merely philological or theoretical, um, in essence, to be poetic in one's um, approach to expression and communication. To do this, um, we see a new approach in sort of higher education curriculum, the Studia Humanitatis. This idea uh, held that the sort of pre-professional vocational focus on education was um, perhaps misguided, certainly too narrow to produce, uh, to use the somewhat cliched phrase, well-rounded individual, and that the student should be exposed to a wide uh, array of sources, literary sources typically from classical Rome, focusing on areas of writing such as uh, perhaps philosophy, history, poetry, again, with the idea of providing the student with a sound foundation of subject matter and um, writing and speaking strategies. This uh, change in the curriculum uh, grows out of a long term, a long time interest in the notion of the liberal arts, the study of things that make one a free person or reflective of free status. And I think that um, humanism with regard to the liberal arts had primarily to do with the problem, again, of expressing knowledge and having the capacity to um, you know, forcefully and creatively uh, convey ideas. As I've already mentioned, rhetoric, therefore, rises to the fore in this period. And to be a good humanist was, uh, in essence, to have the ability to speak 
um, on any number of uh, subjects, typically to the benefit of one's employer. Oftentimes, a um, might be a city, it might be an individual ruler, um, and and be able to uh, basically be a kind of ornament to the court. If we're taking that particular uh, example, a servant to the public, and and this is a big issue. Uh, with the notion of civic humanism, uh, particularly in Florence, where we have the conjunction of uh, men holding political office who are also uh, very, very talented and erudite scholars uh, in their own right. The source, in many ways, for uh, the pursuit of humanism is found in the writings and example, in many ways, of Cicero, Marcus Tullius Cicero, whose dates are from 106 to 43 BCE. Um, Cicero's place in first century BC Rome is, is uh, very, very important. And he's not uh, just important for his uh, activities as a politician, as a lawyer and order, but also for his books. Um, and we have a number of examples of these books um, that were uh, translated, handed down through the centuries, through the Middle Ages. Certainly there's this marked revival of studies of Cicero going from the 15th you received 14th, 15th, 16th century onward, uh, illustrated here to show how recent Cicero and how, how important certainly Cicero would be to the United States, is a copy of Cicero's Tusculan Disputations owned by Thomas Jefferson, printed in the 18th century. And Thomas Jefferson's library had, and I think many, many other politicians and significant public figures at the time, uh, had copies of multiple books by Cicero. In essence, Cicero summarizes the um, importance, we were just speaking of rhetoric, the importance of effective, persuasive, eloquent, dignified uh, expression on matters of great public interest. Um, certainly Cicero's own fate in the uh, Civil War following the death of Julius Caesar speaks to his uh, status as a committed and engaged political figure. The sophistication of his language certainly interested uh, people uh, such as, we'll just look at him in a, in a moment, Petrarch, and many, many later authors who prided themselves on the ability to at least emulate uh, Cicero's uh, ability with Latin. Petrarch, 1304-74, to 74, is a very important figure in the um, development of humanism. He certainly set himself up in the 14th century as a, one of the first celebrities, sort of big public figures in, uh, in Europe in the 14th century, and much of his reputation was founded on his uh, travels to various locales in Europe, recovering, retrieving, copying um, Latin manuscripts of various uh, kinds. He also uh, made a pro uh, practice, Petrarch did, of um, sending out writing letters uh, to various people all over Europe with the expectation these letters would be shared, describing uh, his travels, his research, and um, generally providing the model of an engaged and committed humanist dedicated to reviving and restoring uh, the Latin uh, legacy, particularly in literature. And he was very much enamored uh, of Cicero and Cicero's language. And we have ample evidence of that, including this copy of a letter to Cicero, Cicero, of course, being long dead, but, but Petrarch viewed him in many ways as a kind of friend or close companion Another important figure in the development of humanism, of course, is Boccaccio, Giovanni Boccaccio, most noted for his uh, vernacular writing. And this is something he really has in common with Petrarch. Both wrote in Italian, but also were very, very seriously dedicated to the study of uh, Latin and Latin authors. Now, um, this is going to change this focus on Latin as we go into the 15th century, and we'll see uh, particularly by the beginning of the 15th century, a new focus on the study of Greek. Petrarch, for instance, didn't know Greek, um, and uh, I assume the same actually is, this, uh, is the case with Boccaccio. And by the middle, it was only, really only until the only after the middle of the 15th century that we start seeing widespread uh, understanding and use of Greek in humanist studies, along with other languages such as um, Arabic and um, Hebrew. So we have a couple title pages here, again from the Decameron, the famous vernacular work 
And then also Boccaccio's Genealogy of the Gods, which is a very important reference for uh, scholars going ahead. The intersection of humanism and political life is very, very strong in Florence. And we have a number of important individuals, uh, for instance, high-placed government officials such as Leonardo Bruni and Coluccio Salutati, um, who dedicate themselves to, to, in essence, making concrete the connection that Cicero was drawing between um, literature and politics. And certainly they would draw upon the example of someone like Cicero in uh, drawing inspiration and direction guidance for trying to maintain the fractious and unstable Florentine Republic in a reasonable state of stability. This, of course, is going to um, begin to erode with the accession of the Medici family going into the middle of the 15th century. And by the time we go forward into the era of Lorenzo de' Medici, um, who dies in um, uh, 1492, we have a focus perhaps more on the courtly and you know, more specifically literary aspects of humanistic pursuits. We have famous uh, scholars such as Poggio Bracciolini, who among other things discovers a copy of Lucretius's De Natura Rerum, uh, Lorenzo Valla and his famous refutation of the donation of Constantine, the idea that the church had um, control over the basically the Western Roman Empire. Um, he conclusively, I think others had worked on this as well, but conclusively proved that the, that document was a forgery. And perhaps the last of the Italian humanists of whom we pay any t attention, uh, Niccolo Machiavelli, 1469 to 1527, most famous, of course, is the author of The Prince, Lastly, just to round up our quick introduction to humanism, uh, in the north of Europe, as the new sort of linguistic modes and um, ideas and obviously actual primary sources in terms of manuscripts um, are moving out of the south and toward the north, we see a focus by the likes of Erasmus of Rotterdam and many other northern uh, humanists to apply the same kind of philological scholarly modes of investigation not to classical texts per se, that is sorting out Cicero from forgers or um, you know pseudo Ciceros, but focusing instead on works of a religious nature, particularly early Christian writing, which of course was in um, in Latin. Jerome's Vulgate Latin Bible of the fifth century comes under particular investigation by Erasmus, who produces a new edition. Uh, of the Bible in the uh, early 16th century, or I should say the New Testament to be more precise, requiring skills in Greek in particular, and looking again at Jerome's translation. This in many ways is a foundation for the Protestant Reformation as this corrected New Testament uh, is uh, published. We have to understand printing is emerging by 1450 and certainly was an invaluable aid in distributing the knowledge of the humanists. As we go forward into the 16th century, humanism, uh, I think, begins to gradually fade from the scene. Part of this has to do, I think, with the uh, rising strength of vernacular literature, which, of course, had been started in earnest with the work of Dante uh, in the beginning of the 14th century. Uh, Boccaccio's Decameron is another example of vernacular, lit vernacular literature. Petrarch's Canzoniere uh, from, again, the 14th century. All these pointed to a new, robust, and sophisticated vernacular that um, is going to be increasingly important in communicating ideas. I think also the rise of science and the fact that its language was primarily mathematical in nature and didn't rely upon the rhetorical sophistication that we associate with, uh, again, Latin humanists. And some have argued that the humanist emphasis on reviving, preserving, and in many ways perhaps mummifying Latin ensure that Latin became uh, really once and for all a dead language, one that's studied primarily uh, uh, by scholars and not used uh, every day. But there's little question, particularly with regard to the Studia Humanitatis, that humanism plays a role uh, even uh, moving forward into today's uh, education.